Hey everyone, welcome back to Tear and Apologetics. I am so pumped you're joining us today to have Dr. Terry Mortensen. He holds an MDiv and a PhD in the history of geology. He's lectured in 35 countries and formerly served for 26 years with Campus Crusade for Christ in the U.S. and Eastern Europe. He's now an author, a speaker, and a researcher with Answers in Genesis. And we're today we're going to be talking about uh, creation in the world. So Dr. Mortensen, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Well, great. Good to be with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. You haven't been on the podcast before, so to get things started, do you want to talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do? Okay. Well, I, uh, I grew up in Minnesota and went to the University of Minnesota where I majored in mathematics, and it was during my first year at the university that I came to know Christ through Campus Crusade and then eventually joined staff and served overseas for uh, 26 years, most of that. And so since coming to Answers in Genesis in 2001, uh, I've been doing a lot of speaking all over the United States and in a lot of different countries, uh, talking about what the Bible has to say, uh, the history of this controversy, the uh, philosophical assumptions that are driving the, the controversy, and uh, helping people think through the issues. Yeah, that's super cool, and I really love what you're doing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like, like what led you to kind of like this like route of like answers in Genesis and like defending like um, this model of like a young Earth and a literal six day creation and whatnot? Can you talk a little bit about that, Dr. Mortensen? Yeah, well, as as when I came to Christ in college, I was very interested in science, being a math major, and one of the first questions I had was, well, what about evolution? And uh, that was 1972, and I got a hold of a couple of books that really opened my eyes to uh, understand that evolution is not scientific fact, and even uh, the millions of years is not scientific fact. And so I got very interested in reading everything I could, which wasn't very much in 1972. Um, and so then I joined staff with Campus Crusade, and as I shared my faith with college students in this country and then working over in Eastern Europe uh, before the fall of communism, I could see that this issue of evolution was a major stumbling block for people uh, even listening to the gospel, much less believing it. And so I just continued to study on my own. And uh, <clears throat> just before the fall of communism, uh, without any premonition that it was going to collapse, I decided that I needed to go back to seminary uh, to get some additional training. So I did that and then uh, went on and did my Ph.D., looking at the history of this controversy because in in those years i had learned a lot about the scientific evidence and had gone deeply into the biblical arguments and uh so i wanted to know where did that millions of years idea come from and it it came before darwin darwin didn't invent that idea and so my my phd focused on uh the late 18th and early 19th century when the, that idea of millions of years was developed. And I never, I, I planned to uh, continue on with Campus Crusade. I went back to Eastern Europe and uh, served there, living in Hungary for five years. And then uh, Answers in Genesis found out about me and invited me to uh, join staff as a speaker. And so um, I've had a passion for this subject for a long time. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, it's a cool story you have here, and it's amazing how God's used you. Um, so what I want to do now is kind of get into like a brief like sketch of like your case, um, like for young earth creationism. And I'd encourage everyone, um, regardless of where you fall on this debate, to just kind of come into this with an open mind. Um, like I myself, I told you before, like I'm not a like I don't really believe in a young earth. Um, but I come into this conversation, and hopefully with all my biases gone and just kind of ready just like to hear what is said and just think about it. Um, so do you want to kind of lay things out? Like, well, I believe this like thing that answers in Genesis is promoting along with many other Christians is true. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, that the Bible is very clear that, uh, the days in Genesis one are literal days. God created the world in darkness. He created the light. He called the light day. He called the darkness night. And there was evening and morning in one day. And then he numbers the day, one day, second day, third day. And everywhere in the Old Testament where the Hebrew word for day, which is yom, is modified by a number uh, or used in context with evening and morning uh, or night, it, it always means a literal day everywhere else in the Old Testament. So there's no reason to suspect that it doesn't mean that in Genesis 1. 
Uh, furthermore, on day four, God explains why he uh, created the sun, moon, and stars, and that was so that people could measure years and seasons and days. And the movement of the heavenly bodies do enable us to measure those literal uh, periods of time. And think about this. Uh, if, if the Big Bang theory is really true, if God really did create over billions of years, as uh, the evolutionists uh, say, and as many Christians believe, then for most of the existence of the sun, moon, and stars, they did not fulfill the purpose for which God said he created them, namely for man to tell time, because for most of their existence, there were no humans. So, um, but then I, I consider Exodus 20, verse 11, which is in the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. God tells the children of Israel, work six days and rest on the seventh. He uses the same word for day in verse 11 when he says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And so uh, that's God's commentary on Genesis 1. And as I have uh, spoken in uh, 35 countries now, as I have attended seminary and I'm a member of the Evangelical Theological Society, I've presented papers there. Uh, I, I've read a lot of literature by uh, scientists and theologians who favor the, uh, the, an old earth view, like the gap theory or the day age view or the framework hypothesis. I have found that most of them have overlooked Exodus 2011, but it's God's own commentary. And he says he created in six days. Um, then there's also the fact that <clears throat> Jesus said in Mark 10, when he was asked a question about divorce, uh, he, he, the Pharisees said, Moses permitted us to divorce our wives. What do you say? And Jesus took them back to Genesis. He referred to Genesis 1. He quoted from Genesis 2, and he says, he said, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So in Jesus' statement, it is implied that he believed that Adam and Eve were back there at the beginning of creation, not 14 billion years after the beginning. Uh, so these are some of the biblical uh, arguments. Then there's a kind of a, I guess, a biblical or a theological point that I again have found most Christians both those who are young earth and those who hold to an old earth view have not thought carefully about, if at all, and that is um, if we accept the millions of years, then we're accepting what the geological uh, scientific community uh, says, and where did they get the millions of years? They didn't just invent that number. Uh, they got it from the rocks of the earth, supposedly, that is full of fossils and fossils are dead things. So if we accept the millions of years, whether we realize it or not, we're accepting that there's been millions of years of animal death, disease, massive extinction. The evolutionists say there've been five major mass extinction events in earth history. And that's all before man, according to an evolutionary view. If that's really true, then the fall in Genesis three, where God cursed not only uh, judge not only Adam and Eve, but curse the animals, curse the ground, thorns and thistles will grow for you. Um, that's all false, if the millions of years is really true. This is a huge theological problem of accepting the, the millions of years. So those are some of the biblical uh, reasons why I am a young earth creationist. The last one I would just mention is that Genesis 6 to 8 is describing a global year-long catastrophic flood. Uh, there are many Christians who believe it was a local flood in the Middle East, but there is no way to get a local flood out of the text of Genesis if we pay attention to all of the details there. So uh, that event would have been uh, key to understanding the, uh, the geological record of rock layers and fossils and those rock layers show evidence of having been deposited in water, not in a desert. And there's lots of evidence in the layers and between the layers that indicate they were not formed over hundreds of millions of years, as the scientific majority claims. So those are, those are some of the uh, reasons that I, biblically, that I think this is an important issue. Uh, 
and it, it's foundational to the gospel because Jesus came to solve the problem that started in the Garden of Eden. And so if we begin to uh, change our understanding of Genesis, it can undermine the gospel. And uh, so I'll leave it there. We can talk a little bit about the, the philosophy or the assumptions behind the science if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to get into that um, in just a second. So one thing I'm just thinking about, though, first on like the biblical like side of things, Dr. Mortensen, mm -hmm. um, is I'm wondering, like, there's a lot of different like views about like within people that maybe like rejected young earth among Christians. Um, and some of those views, like I think about someone like I believe Dr. Craig would say, like, yes, like G I could be wrong here. Um, but I believe like people like some people will say that, like, hey, like there is like a literal six days and they're fine with that. Um, but that doesn't lead to an old earth, whether they want to argue through like, like a John Walton kind of style of things or a different kind mm -hmm. of view. Um, yeah. so what are your thoughts on like people like that who are like, yeah, like I'm cool with this literal six day thing. I just don't think it means like what you think it means, Dr. Mortensen. Yeah. Well, first of all, Dr. Craig doesn't believe in six literal days. He accepts the millions of years. So does John Walton. John Walton says that Genesis one is not a creation account. It's actually God giving function to an already pre-existing creation that was created before Genesis 1. And so he says the Bible is silent on material origins, so we can just go with whatever the evolutionists say. So in both cases, they have made the scientific establishment's claims their final authority for how they're going to understand Genesis. Um, but in both cases, um, they I, I've read their literature and they don't they don't understand the problem of millions of years of death and disease and extinction in the animal world before the fall and uh they've never they've never refuted the young earth creationist arguments um if your viewers want to look at at this a little bit more in depth I have an article, it's not difficult, but on our website, answersingenesis.org, if they just search for my name and uh, the words natural evil, they'll find an article about the fall and the problem of millions of years of natural evil. It's a really important uh, question. So um, if, I'm going, if I'm talking to a fellow evangelical who says that he believes that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, then I want him to show me from scripture that millions of years is in Genesis or can be accepted within Genesis, and it doesn't have any effect on our understanding of the rest of the Bible and the gospel. And I don't think Dr. Craig or Dr. Walton have done that. I think they have taken as their starting point what the scientific majority says, and then they're using that to interpret Genesis and to say, well, it doesn't mean exactly what it says, or some things are literal. In the case of Dr. Craig, he calls Genesis 1 to 11 mytho history. So it's part mythology, part history. But I would argue from the scriptures, there's no basis for saying there's any myth uh, anywhere in the Bible, except the few places where the Bible itself exposes the myth. Okay, so this is very helpful. Thank you. Um, and thinking about this, like you referenced, like the idea of like having like the Bible as like our starting point, um, mm -hmm. which is I think something that like just about every Christian would hopefully agree with. Um, so, what do you think about like? So you re you re you referenced like. Um, John Walton, who you, he's who he like, it seems like he just says that like the Bible is just silent on like the idea of like material origins. Um, so if that's, there's no starting point there in the Bible, he seems to defer to scientific consensus. Is the disagreement kind of just like you think there is like a biblical like starting point and for like the question of like material origins? Well, uh, to say that the Bible is not describing the creation of the world. Uh, is to go against 2,000 years of Christian orthodoxy and another 14, 000, 1,400 years of uh, Jewish orthodoxy. The, everybody has always believed that Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the world. His idea is a novel idea that it's only talking about giving function to an already existing uh, creation. And he bases that on the fact that uh, not only has he allowed the scientific uh, majority's view to dominate his thinking, but he's also started with the assumption that 
that the Israelites had the same view, worldview, as their ancient Near Eastern pagan uh, neighbors. And that is fundamentally false uh, because the biblical worldview contradicts the pagan views in lots of ways. And a number of uh, scholars, uh, one is uh, John Oswald. Uh, he's not a young earth creationist, but he has a book the Bible uh, uh, and uh, against the pagans or something. And he shows point by point about 10 points of diametrically opposed aspects of the worldview of the Bible versus the worldview of the ancient Near Eastern uh, pagan countries, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt. And uh, furthermore, think about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul says, uh, what is also said several times in the Old Testament, the book of Levit Leviticus and elsewhere, that when the when the, the the pagans worship idols, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, they are worshiping demons. So uh, the Bible is very clear. There are demonic spirits. There are fallen angels who are influencing the world. Uh, Satan is the god of this world. And so these idolatrous religions are are not just wrong because of a uh, sinful man coming up with their own ideas about God and how to relate to God, but there are demons influencing their thinking. And so uh, the same is true of evolution. It was born in the, in the, in the womb of the atheist worldview. Darwin basically became an atheist or at least an agnostic uh, before he published his book. And many of the men who developed the idea of millions of years were atheists or deists. And so it was from that worldview that they were interpreting the rocks and the fossils. And then in the case of Darwin, living things. They didn't just go out and look at the world with an empty mind and say, well, let's let the facts speak for themselves. In fact, there's no such human being. Nobody has ever looked at the world with an empty mind. Everybody has a worldview. They have a certain set of assumptions. Does God exist or doesn't he? Is God active in this world or isn't he? Is the Bible the word of God or is it not? Those are all philosophical, religious questions that can't be proven or disproven by any scientific lab experiment. So they are beliefs. Uh, and there are good reasons to believe that the Bible is the word of God. There's good reasons to believe that God created the world. So um, I would just say uh, Dr. Walton has invented a, an idea that has no basis in the scriptures or in the history of Christianity. Uh, Genesis 1 is a creation account. And again, back to Exodus 20, which Dr. Walton hasn't paid attention to. God says he created everything in six days. So God is saying that Genesis 1 is a creation account of material origins. Okay, so one thing you kind of hinted at here that I'd love to like explore in the little bit we have left is this idea of like the scientific consensus. It seems like a lot of people would be under the impression that like the vast majority of scientists um, would deny this whole young earth model, um, saying sure. the earth is billions of years old and we have this evolutionary account. Um, and many Christians as well would be um, in some way, shape or form, agree with some parts of that or all parts of that story. Um, so like, how do you make sense of that? Like um, being in a view that is like not widely accepted among like the scientific community? Okay, great question. Well, first of all, truth is not determined by majority vote. Uh, truth is determined by whether the truth claim is consistent with reality uh, and uh, what we observe as well as the reality of the Bible. The Bible claims to be the word of the creator who uh, was there at the beginning, was there all the way through history, who knows everything, who always tells the truth, and who gave us the Bible as his inspired word uh, without error in the original languages of Greek and Hebrew and a little bit in Aramaic. And we have reliable English, Spanish, German, Russian translations. So, um, so Truth is not determined by majority vote. Secondly, ever since the development of the idea of millions of years in the late 18th and early 19th century, science has been controlled by an atheistic worldview. 
a deistic, atheistic worldview that says, makes two assumptions, and almost all scientists are working with these assumptions. The first is that nature is all that exists. That's not a scientific statement. That's a philosophical religious belief. Can't prove that scientifically. And secondly, that everything must, can and must be explained by three things. Time plus chance plus the laws of nature working on matter. So if you have those three things, time, enough of it, chance and the laws of chemistry, the laws of physics, the laws of genetics, you can explain the origin of everything. The origin of stars and galaxies, the solar system, the earth, the rock layers and fossils, living creatures, the origin of man, the origin of language. You just need enough time, chance and the laws of nature. Not all scientists are atheists, um, but most scientists do their scientific work as if atheism and those assumptions are true. And so they have discounted the Bible and most Christians in science have, have not paid attention to what the Bible actually says, or they've developed very, uh, very clever ways of explaining the Bible to make it fit with evolution in millions of years. But it, it really doesn't, those ideas don't stand up to scrutiny. And I, I co-edited a book uh, back in 2000 and uh, what was it? I think it was 2008 called uh, Coming to Grips with Genesis. And it was uh, 14 authors, most of them seminary professors, giving an in-depth defense of young earth creation biblically. And so we are well aware of what uh, other Christians are saying, how they're trying to fit millions of years in. And those, those, uh, those writings do not deal with the in-depth arguments that young earth creationists make biblically. And they, they keep raising the same kinds of objections that we have uh, answered in, in many years. So um, uh, we don't go with the scientific majority because in the history of science, the scientific majority has been wrong many times. And scientists are not infallible. Scientists don't know everything. Scientists were not there during the millions of years that they talk about as if they saw it all. Um, and here, think about this. Scientists today are very specialized in their area of science. So in their area of expertise, uh, they're, they're specialists. But outside their area of expertise, they're lay people, just like the rest of us. Just because somebody has a PhD in biochemistry doesn't make him uh, qualified any more than you or I to speak about radiometric dating methods or how far stars are or how, uh, how mutations happen in the genome, in the DNA. Uh, and so what's happened is everybody in science all over the world has been trained in this evolutionary way of thinking, and they control all the publishing houses. They control the science programs on television, the science institutes, the science journals, and they only allow an evolutionary, atheistic-based perspective. And so, of course, everybody's going to, the vast majority is going to believe what they've been taught from preschool all the way through high school and university. But it's not because they're actually experts in all those fields. They're trusting what the scientific majority says. But I've, I've met, uh, I've met scientists who in their own field admit there are problems with evolution or things that they can't answer in their field, but they trust the rest of the scientific community where they don't have any expertise to really verify what's being said. So that's why we don't go with the scientific majority on this issue when we have the clear teaching uh, of the Bible. If the Bible was obscure, if the Bible just started out, uh, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there was a man named Adam, and he sinned, and and uh, he died, and, and then there was a, a big flood, and a man named Noah survived in a boat, and then there was a man named Abraham. If that's the way Genesis started, and you didn't have any of that information in Genesis 1 to 11, 
except in just very few statements, then we could go with what the scientific community says because the Bible is silent. But if we believe the Bible is God's word, then we, we have to take seriously what Genesis 1 to 11 says, just as we have to take seriously what the four gospels say about the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, Dr. Mortensen, thank you so much for coming on today and just sharing. Um, it's very helpful, and there's a lot to think about here. Um, any like last thoughts or things you want to share before we start to wrap up here? Yeah, I would just encourage your your Christian listeners and your non-Christian li listeners to uh, use their critical thinking skills and actually go to our website, answersingenesis.org. We've got over 10,000 articles. We've got a good search engine in the top right corner. And uh, there's a lot of technical material there, but a lot, most of it's understandable to people who aren't expertise uh, in science. And uh, just encourage you to think carefully about this issue, because what we believe about where we came from uh, will have a very huge impact on our view on moral questions. Uh, well, you know, we're, we're, our country is just being ripped apart by the LGBTQ controversy. controversy. Well, the Bible says God made two genders, male and female. He says he created marriage. It's a man and a woman. Uh, the Bible says humans are made in the image of God. They're not animals. And so the Bible is very clear that abortion is wrong. Suicide is wrong. Euthanasia is wrong. Uh, and uh, sex outside of marriage is wrong. So uh, depending on what you believe about origins will determine what you believe about those moral issues. Uh, it will it will determine what you believe about uh, people who have a different shade of brown skin color from you. Um, the Bible says there's only one race. But if evolution is true, evolutionary theory implies that different people evolve different amounts uh, over the years. And if you if you do some Google searches for those diagrams about human evolution from ape to man, Pay attention to the diagrams and notice that in most of those diagrams, they are racist diagrams because the apes and the monkeys have dark skin. And when you get to the last one that's supposedly fully human, it's a Caucasian. The diagrams are racist. But the Bible says we are made in the image of God and there's only one race. So this is a critical issue. And finally, Jesus, if you look in the Gospels, Jesus believed Genesis 1 to 11 is literal history. So did the New Testament writers. And they based their teaching on the gospel, on marriage, on other issues, on the literal history in Genesis. So when we start messing with Genesis, we're, whether we realize it or not, we're undermining the, the teaching, the truth, and the authority of Jesus and the apostles, and thereby undermining the gospel. And as I have spoken in, in 35 countries, I have found that the teaching of evolution and the millions of years, because you really can't separate them, is the single biggest reason today why hundreds of millions of people uh, are not even willing to listen to the gospel. Uh, so it's a, it's a really important issue, and I encourage your, your listeners to, to think for themselves. Don't just go with the scientific majority. Think for yourself. Investigate. You know, if you've never read creationist scientific and biblical arguments, then you really are not being intellectually uh, rigorous and seeking the truth. Hmm. Yeah, I'd encourage people to just read both sides, listen to both sides, and be fair. Like, read, I read um, the book you, I believe, edited Searching for Truth, and it really helped me um, appreciate and understand more where, like, young earth creationists are coming from more than any podcast I'd ever listened to or things like that. Just reading what the other side has to say um, is very helpful. So I encourage everyone to do that. Um, thank you so much for coming on today, Dr. Mortensen. Uh, how can people, like, follow you, connect with you, things like that? Well, I'm getting older, so I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not on Twitter or Facebook. I let uh, I let Answers in Genesis do all of that. They've, Ken Ham is prolific on Facebook and Twitter and all those things. So, but the best would be to just go uh, to our website, AnswersInGenesis.org, and uh, do some searching and uh, think carefully. 
Well, Dr. Mortensen, thank you so much for coming on today. I'll leave some links down below where people can follow you, connect with you, things like that. Um, and yeah, that's that. If you guys are new to here in Apologetics, I'd encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. We really value what you do. And as always, this podcast is brought to you by you guys. So if you value what we do, you can go support us at patreon.com slash here in Apologetics. You can do that for as little as a dollar a month, and that would be huge. Um, one last time, Dr. Terry Mortensen, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. It's been a great conversation, and I've enjoyed it a lot. Okay. Good to talk to you, Zach. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a good one, and God bless. We'll catch you later. Bye-bye.